This is our interview with Roger from The Quill. Super nice guy. Super oh nice. my God. And their music, this record, if you haven't checked it out, it's really solid, really good. The songs that we played for you are, you know, they're not even the best songs on the record. So yeah. anyway, uh, take it away. So where you're located at? We're on the East Coast in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the weather's like there, but it is cold here. Yeah, we're in our really bad cold snap. We, no. we woke up yesterday. And pro it was like a surprise snow. I was like, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we had it snow. It's been a little bit on and off. We had snow for a couple of weeks and then it all melted away and it, oh, you, you start to get the spring feeling and then all of a sudden it's snowing again. So <laughs> it's that right, time of year, false, I guess. That fall yeah. spring feeling. Yeah. 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 It was pretty bad. I, I was surprised because they hadn't, they didn't call for it at all. And around here, snow doesn't last really long. As soon as like the no. sun comes out, it, it melts. But I was like, really? Yeah, it's a very inconvenient. Yeah. <laughs> was it really necessary? <laughs> right, exactly. Wait, I was going to go out for a run yesterday. I'm like, well, that's shot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was really excited to see the new album. Uh, it had been so long since I'd um, heard from the Quill. And it looks like you guys are back to the, pretty much the original lineup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, can you talk a little bit about what brought you back together? Were you, were you, was it just, uh, uh, were you apart? Were you, uh, were there other projects? Like, wh wh well, I guess why so long? Uh, I guess it was basically life uh, came in between. I, I stepped out uh, for a while, a couple of years from the band. I had uh, other commitments, work and uh, family life and children and everything. And, cool. and the same went for, for Magnus, our singer. He took a couple of years off as well. He just handling life, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we, it all came together really organically. We just, uh, we were asked to do sort of a, a show for fun doing just Kiss covers. And we had no singer for that one. The, the, we had a singer in between uh, and and a friend of ours asked, can't you just play some Kiss songs at a, a party I'm having? And then we just oh, got asked among this. We live in the same in the same area, all of us. Uh, so we started out playing Kiss covers, and then when we were rehearsing, uh, we you just automatically uh, someone had a riff, and we started jamming again, and it, it all came together really easy. And it was never any hard feelings uh, between all the four of us leaving. It was. It, we we were friends uh, even when we weren't in the band seeing each other and 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 everything. So it was it was really easy getting together again. So that explains that picture on your Instagram page. Was that you guys and all the makeup and everything? Uh, I don't know what what do you refer to. I don't know what you're referring to. There was to. a post on the Instagram page that was like Kiss Army, and I wasn't sure. And it was like everybody yeah. in makeup, and I was like, was that you guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I don't know. Probably we we didn't do it. And make every, everyone else had makeup at the party, but we didn't. We're too ugly. We had too much beard. All yeah, 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 we can't put on yeah. makeup. <laughs> yeah, he has that problem too. Like occasionally, we'll do like little fun promo shots with like you know the yeah the corpse paid, and he's like, I have to get this off. I don't know how you could perform yeah. with makeup the whole time. I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's it's really. I did it once when I was young, for some. We had some sort of thing in school, but it was such a nightmare doing it. So I'm I, yeah, I'm yeah. not planning on doing it ever again. And now since Kiss is retired, so it's really no reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I noticed you talked about something, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Samalak stubbornness. What yeah. would that translate to? As uh, small and it, that's the part of, of Sweden we come from, and we're we're known to it's it's a really harsh landscape, and and uh, people here are sort of quiet and minding their own business and doing their their thing, and you sort of everyone is stubborn, and in, in, I guess in a way, uh, and you just you just keep on keeping on, I guess uh, whatever comes your way, uh, and that's I, I think that's sort of the our band's identity as well. We've been around for 30 years now uh, doing, I think it's it's our 11th album, this one. Uh, and this, I don't know, we just continue to do what we do. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that yeah, I, I can see that uh, and that's part of our mentality, I guess, here around in this part of Sweden. Yeah. It's a funny story. I remember like I read about Tim Finn from Crowded House. They finally got signed to EMI. EMI called yeah. them. They, they live in... Uh, in New Zealand and they, they got the big call that they were looking for. This is in the eighties. And uh, the response was, well, we're in the middle of dinner right now. 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just, it's a certain yeah. mindset. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess uh, along our long career, we have sort of made decisions that were kind of probably from a business perspective perspective kind of stupid but you had to sort of be true to your to your own sort of idea of what you want to do in uh, i guess yeah. so, but no. then when you look back when you look back at it back at it you can think oh that was a stupid idea <laughs> why did we say no to that one that would have been a great thing to do <laughs> well yeah i mean uh wayne kramer just passing away recently i was telling yeah. stacy the story i have a book about it i don't think any band made more bad decisions than mc5 if you read it it's just like a nightmare no. with the black panthers and the just yeah. the, 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 their choices for being such a great band it was just like oh god how not to do it you know yeah yeah, yeah. but but i guess I, I guess it's better to fail on your own on on your own terms mm -hmm. and by your own decisions by uh, or and sort of failing on on other ones other people's decisions uh, yeah, at least course. at the end of it you can say we stay true to what we believed in what i guess believed in. Exactly. yeah yeah very good so do you remember who came up with the name the quill or uh, where it came we, from we've discussed it i think it's long lost in time <laughs> <laughs> uh, our drummer and our guitarist they've been playing together since they started out as kids uh, basically, uh, when they were like 12, 13 years old, uh, just like kids do. And they've been together ever since. And then gradually it became more and more sort of uh, professional. And I think the final step uh, came when I joined in 95 and we got a record contract. Uh, but I think it was actually spelt Quill with just one L, sort of a made up word from the beginning. <clears throat> and then when it got serious, no one understood what it meant. Uh, so we had to sort of reshape it. So, it, uh, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's maybe not the most rock and roll name of them all, but it's been around for so long now. But I don't think anyone really knows what it, where it came from. It's so long, long, we're, we're so old now, so we're starting to forget things. <laughs> we're sort of like Ace Freely. You don't remember anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, just speaking of speaking of uh, the, the early days, I... I remember when Meteor City re remastered the the first album was the first time I heard it. And I want to say it was like late nineties. I just, I always thought that first Quill record was so far ahead of its time. I, you know, I used to tell my friends, these guys should have gotten that Queens of the Stone Age money, you know? Yeah. What was, what was it like back then? I mean, were, were you, were you guys told, you know, this is, you, you guys are, you know, did you, did you get a lot of uh, uh, false promises, I guess, you know? Yeah, in a way, I, I guess so. But as you said, we've always been, sort of it was a little bit of time, uh, ahead of its time and then we came early in the whole stone and rock movement as well but we've always been a little bit different and we never really fit it in we actually spoke to our label about it our record label and they said you've you always been sort of uh either ahead or a little bit late <laughs> for stuff <laughs> and i <laughs> and we never really uh -huh. sort of just uh, it was we never really were at the right place at the right time I guess oh, uh, but uh, as for the Stone Rock movement we got a lot of, of uh, sort of uh, um, uh, I don't know I guess we, we got big record contracts around that time and everything but we always since we have a singer with a, a totally different style from most Stone Rock movements the Stone Rock movement uh, I guess we sort of never really fitted in that category either uh and so so it's i mean i i, I always refer to to us as classic hard rock sort yeah. of the led zeppelin deep purple black Definitely, sabbath yeah. style of music uh that, so and i mean we always written the songs we we like we never sort of try it we've never been like what's what's sort of hot right now and try to fit in in that mold that was never our, our thing at all yeah, I was curious about that because the early stuff definitely sounds a little bit more grunge. So yeah. I guess it was just the era and not you guys trying to like, you know, compete with that. His voice is so incredible. Oh I mean, yeah. 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 I mean, we got a lot of, I mean, in the early days, we got a lot of re references to Soundgarden and Chris Cornell and they have sort oh. of a similar way of, of, of singing and I guess I mean we we all we are all big music fans and we listen to music all the time and you can't help but being influenced by by the stuff you listen to and and the grunge movement was 
definitely something we listen to all those bands Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains and, and all that stuff. There were some great records made around that time. So it, you can hear a little bit of that, uh, especially in the early albums, uh, as you say. I really like, uh, there's a lot of slide guitar on the new record. Like, uh, it seems like, I don't remember a lot of that on the past records. It, it, it really comes through well. Like, how did that, who decided to kind of lace that in, I guess? I don't know, really. I mean, we always try to find a little bit of bits and pieces of stuff that you haven't heard on albums before. Yeah. And and uh, Christian is a really good blues player as well. He has another blues project. He's he's actually in the studio recording a new album with it right now. So he's been playing a lot of blues uh, this past few years, I guess. Uh, and sort of he's always been a really good guitar player, but the, the sort of blues is slider stuff has certainly improved a lot over these these years since he, he started playing with this, this uh, blues band as well. Or sort of, it's not a blues band, it's sort of rock blues, more in Johnny Winter style. Uh, and, and as I said, we always try to find some instrument or something to, to keep each album fresh and, and give the listener something they haven't heard from a, on a Quill album before. So there's a little bit of keyboards as well on this one. I actually... I play a little bit of mandolin on one track as well. It was sort of my Corona project <laughs> when you were sitting around for two years and you have nothing to do. And I said, fuck, I'm, what am I going to do with all this time? Yeah. So I, I always wanted to learn to play the mandolin. So I went to the music store and bought myself a mandolin and just sat, sat around for months playing. So that what that's what I got from the Corona years. Well, okay, I, got year. I learned to play <laughs> mandolin. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love the sound on on this one. It's so southern rock, and I I work for a doctor, but he wasn't in the office Friday, so I was just at my desk and I had it playing. And yeah. a girl I work with came up to me. They're like, "Are they from Louisiana?" I'm like, no, <laughs> "They're not." Not exactly. No, no, no. We're we're from sort of, and, and I I guess you can't can't even say that this part of Sweden is Sweden's Louisiana because this, as I said, is really harsh country here so it's no not no Louisiana at all but I guess there's some southern rock too we love like black crows and linen skin and all that stuff as well so uh, I guess that we take a little bits and pieces of, of all the music we like and add it to to our own songwriting you know this the leads are great I it's I, I was playing them for Stacey I was like this is this is you can make a you can create a dramatic solo without having to play a thousand miles an hour the entire time you know you can it, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's very nice yeah yeah, and everything was, we approach each album a little bit different. And the last one, uh, the Earthrise album, we went in with sort of sketches of the songs and, and sort of um, built them in the studio and had really no idea what, what they would sound like. Uh, but this one we wanted, because, and that took a lot of time and we went back and forth. And, and this time we wanted to have sort of a quicker approach. So we rehearsed everything really well in the rehearsal room. So once we went into the studio, everything was sort of went really quick. We have sort of basically basically everything was more or less finished, except, I guess, for the solos. Christian always wants to sort of do them on the spot and sort of get inspiration in the moment. Um, but this time he did them in the studio. On the last album, he recorded all his solos at home by himself. Uh, so a little bit of a different approach. And we, as I said, we tried to keep things fresh and um by doing stuff a little bit different for each album do you usually do you usually uh, write the albums in the studio like over the years or do you usually go in like this one where you kind of have everything rehearsed up front what do you prefer i think we work as a band covid changed it a little bit because we usually always met in the rehearsal room and someone had someone has an idea usually it's jolly our drummer or christian the guitarist who's sort of right the the main part of the music and they come with sort of it could just be a riff or something and then we all jam on it and then magnus writes all the the, the melodies and, and lyrics uh, but this time is just because of covid we st mm -hmm. we sat at home and writing a lot and sending ideas uh over the over the internet from it to each other and and everyone so then we got together sort of he picked these are the ideas uh, i i really like and then we met in the rehearsal room once all the regulations were lifted here in sweden uh, and and sort of just put it all together but that's sort of the first 
time we did it that way we um, previously we always sort of written everything all four of us in the rehearsal room yeah i was impressed um you know was that also a pandemic problem to put together that you know the live new borrowed and blue album yeah you know and kind of pick everything but you guys are a really good live band too I, you know how did you go about picking what songs you wanted to include i don't know it was actually the, that whole album the idea was we were uh, we were meant to tour really in europe we had a european tour booked and, and the record company wanted to have uh, a product out and we had the earthrise album was already a year old uh, and during the whole pandemic I, I was sitting around at home i have a, a, sort of all of the master tapes and everything we record and 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 there was no time to re record anything uh, and we had a couple of live recordings we had the there's a couple of live tracks on that live new bar blue album from sweden rock uh, but there was some problems with the recording it was when you record at a festival it's always other band uh, playing at the, the simultaneously so our our live recording has a couple of tracks that are okay but re the rest of them all the mics are, are sort of pick up stuff from from uh, other shows uh, at the festival era so but well, two what two tracks we could use uh, which were sort of cool but it uh, it's it's a shame because the show was really good, but sound wise they were. But I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping a AI will fix that, <laughs> so you can sort of erase that stars. stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, we got some other stuff. Yeah, we did a 30 anniversary show here uh, last May, and we recorded that one as well. So that's on the shelf. So we will probably have to look into that one as well. So th there's there's some stuff in the vaults. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, you did a great job on that Aerosmith SOS. Um, how did you go about picking that one? I mean, it fit perfect. Yeah, that was recorded a long time ago. Uh, there were at the end of the '90s. There were a lot of these tribute albums being made, uh, and we would offer were, were offered a, a lot of them. I think we did one for Trouble. We did one for Aerosmith. I think we did for uh, Captain Beyond as well. Uh, and we had all these. And I can't remember really why we chose SOS. Uh, or it, I think maybe for that album, I think they asked us, can you please do this one? Because we want it on the tribute album. So I don't even think it was our idea. Um, and it's always fun to play these covers. We always try to sort of stay a little, a little bit true to the original, but always try to f sort of get our change a little bit uh, uh, in it. And I think the SOS cover is one. I think we changed the whole riff and the and the verses and everything, and came up with something uh, different, which made it kind of fresh. I think I think it's a really cool track that actually. Yeah, that's one of my rules for covers. They can't if they're to be really good. They kind of have to be reinvented and die. So I yeah. love that. You know, it's yeah. like, it took me a minute to realize. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, have, what have they done to my favorite song? <laughs> no, it's, it funny. made it better. And that's <laughs> yeah. that's the key. As soon as I hear yeah. that, I'm like, yeah, it's even better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a cool but, track. So I love the the Wheel of Illusion um, kind of concept. And obviously, it's, it's, it's about kind of, you know, religion being a bad thing which i kind of agree with do you think yeah. that there's any difference between like organized religion and like a cult i guess uh, i'm actually I, I used to work as a uh, as a teacher in religion i'm i'm not doing that now but i i, I actually i had an exam as a, a teacher of religion so you can get a whole lecture from me now if you want to but i, I won't get into that <laughs> the, the artwork uh, there's a lot going on there's a lot, yeah, going, on a lot going on. Yeah, and yeah. I, I guess if you take anything and take it to the extreme, it, it becomes a cult. It could be religion or it could be whatever. It could be, uh, I mean, there's so much in society now that sort of you, everyone is taking everything to the edge, I guess. Uh, and, and, the, and the album is about that. I mean, it, it is troubled times with you have the war in Israel and, and Palestine. And, and here we have the, the war in, in, with Ukraine and Russia. It's, it's sort of really shaking Sweden as well. I mean, we're a country, we haven't been to war for over 200 years. And now everyone is sort of, the military is, is sort of um, 
uh, all of a sudden they, they put a lot of money into the military in Sweden, which, which we haven't done in years and years and years. And, and everyone is starting to get a bit concerned. And I guess the album is a little bit about that because uh, it's about war and it's about religion and the bad side of a religion. Religion could be a good thing to lots of people, but if you take anything to, to the extreme, uh, I, I think it's everything in moderation, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you do. Yeah, like they have this crazy stuff. They've done a bunch of documentaries on, on the Mormons out in Salt Lake. And, you know, it, it's incredible when, they're you know, some guy with 42 wives and 300 children yeah. and... <laughs> my god and i'm like this this is they bad. all they all make the same mistake though they all make one person immortal and then when the person dies they're like what do we yeah. do now like it yeah i can't believe that they don't plan for that it's just like oh we need to have a meeting you know yeah exactly <laughs> and and as i say in sweden is the sort of religion is really not a big part uh here it, it, not in the sort of in the political life as it is in in the u.s where religion is really a a big part of of the politics as well it's not here at all in sweden but it's starting it's starting to creep in as well uh, just because of the troubled times and because of i mean we're really influenced by america as well and you have a lot of swedish politicians looking at the u.s and, and sort of trying to pick up bits and pieces of what's working in the U S and I don't really think that necessarily is a good thing. No, <laughs> you there's not much working. Things, nah, nah, <laughs> nah. Uh, I, 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 I don't, I really don't have any opinion about it because it, I mean, we, you, you get media's view of everything and, and, and uh, everything is twisted. So you sort of have to find your own way and your own beliefs in a lot of, of, yeah. of what's going on uh, right now. Sure. Yeah, I still can't believe in this day and age we're still invading each other. I'm like, can we? Yeah, yeah, it's hard huh? to believe. Yeah. So yeah, I want to talk about. Everyone the... was sort of yeah, really surprised by that as well, and it's yeah. certainly stirred up a lot of things here in Sweden. Absolutely. So I want to talk about the album artwork a little bit. It's really striking. Like, where did you guys? Uh, was it an artist that you worked with before? How did you come about the? That middle looks like the Eye of Sauron. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically, I mean, we worked. He's a German guy called Sebastian uh, Jarke. He he done the art. He's done the artwork for uh, Earthrise and Born from Fire. So this is his third album for us, and, and we really like his style. Uh, and he's actually working. He's actually painting by hand. It's not digital artwork. Most of of all the artists today doing album and designs are doing digital stuff. But he's that's really a, an original painting. Uh, which I think is really sort of, I, I like the the craftsmanship of it all. Yeah. And the idea really came from that's sort of the the Buddhist uh, Buddhist sign for the wheel of life. That was sort of was the the embryo of it all. And then we took that idea and he and he sort of read all the lyrics. And so you can find sort of images. All the images are related to the to the lyrics on the album, and so, and the whole wheel thing is is uh, sort of a Buddhist influence. I guess yeah. it's funny so talking about artists. We, uh, we, we, we have an artwork on the show from time to time and we'll see an artist that we really like their uh, album work artwork or, uh, at a gallery the other day, we, we, we saw a really striking artist, but every time I want to reach out, I remember that the guy that we use is free. So yeah. <laughs> we, well, we have to remind each other, uh, yeah. Let's stick with the free guy. Yeah, he, yeah, he might not be guy, the yeah. best, but he doesn't charge anything. So yeah. No, uh, this <laughs> this guy is a little bit expensive, but I think it's worth it. I mean, yeah. I mean we come from the old school of sitting around just look, looking at vinyl records, and yeah. and so we we sort of we make stuff that we like ourselves uh, yeah. and something that we would want to have in our hands and look at. And so I love all those old Iron Maiden covers where you could oh, sit yeah. for hours and just look at stuff and find new stuff each time. Uh, and he's, he's sort of from that old school of, of artwork. So, uh, and, and people seem to, to really enjoy it as well that you put some time and effort to it because for a while there, when you were doing only CDs, no one really cared about the artwork because everything was so small. You yeah. couldn't, you couldn't really work with the format at all. But then, yeah. when the whole vinyl resurrection uh, started, everyone was started to pay more attention to the artwork again, which I think is really fantastic. Yeah, that's great. I I love that 
we're starting to see reissues of there was that black period where like from like 98 to 03 where like a lot of stuff just was only on cd i love seeing yeah. that we're starting to get vinyl versions of that stuff because there was a lot of really great records that came out during that period that only came out digital you know yeah absolutely and a lot of I, I I continued to buy vinyl records for quite a long time, and a lot of those records you bought around ninety five, ninety six, ninety seven. They they were they were a fortune now, <laughs> because yeah. there was a small small they, press, they were, yeah, yeah, small yeah. pressing. So uh, I have a lot of that stuff. That's sort of I'm keeping that for for retirement. <laughs> That's your retirement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we've really seen a resurgence of, of vinyl stores, you know, that have popped up. It's it's really great because, I mean, we collect tons of stuff. So and it's it's not so much that we play it, but that, you know, you have this piece of art yeah, as well as the music. So. Right. And I growing yeah, up, it's cool to see. I mean, I mean, we're all sort of record collectors in the band and it's cool to see younger people getting into it as well. My, I have a daughter who's 18 years old who wanted a record play for, for Christmas, last Christmas. So, and of course I bought her one. <laughs> if she wanted one, I, I'm buying it. Yeah. So we're going mm. to like record fairs together now and uh, searching for it. We went to London this uh, last November, just buying records, me and my daughter. And that's, that's a perfect father and daughter thing to that's do. That's great. Yeah. Vinyl yeah. shopping in London. <laughs> was yeah, expensive the, though, because I have to pay for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah in the, in the old days the record store was not just for buying records it was a hangout you know we would meet yeah. other people there and there was it was like a cultural thing and we just talk about artwork and you know different people who like different kind of music we could communicate it was really like a it was like a like a community center almost a virtual know? not yeah. even a virtual chat a non-virtual chat room right an, an actual yeah. in-person chat room yes absolutely and you had like artists coming and doing signings and you could buy yes. rec had tickets for shows and everything as i said it was sort of pre it was uh, uh, social media <laughs> in yeah. a way in, in its true nature <laughs> right. right yeah and also we we love the video for wheel of illusion it was like you could just see how on you guys are and um where where was it shot because kind was of actually yeah, it was actually shot in our rehearsal room. We have quite a big rehearsal. That's a good thing. We're living in a remote part of Sweden. It's really easy to get good rehearsal spaces. If you live sort of in uh, in Stockholm or anywhere, it's really difficult to get a good rehearsal room. But down here, we live in the south east coast, by the southeast coast of Sweden. It's really good to get a really good rehearsal space. So we had the same uh, really big room now for 30 years. Uh, so we sort of just... Uh, Use a little a part of the rehearsal room and shot it there actually. So, uh, and I'm glad you like it. It's a lot of cool stuff. This and our drummer went to Mexico for a vacation, so he shot all the uh, all the sort of images from the cemeteries are stuff he shot and uh, at a Mexican cemetery you know, during his vacation. We had to have him work. If you're going on vacation, you're shot, shooting some stuff for the video. Exactly. You're always doing something for the band, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have a couple of, I actually got, a, uh, we have another video coming up uh, in two weeks. Uh, so I got a, sort of a first view of that one as well. It looks really cool. It's totally different, but you have to wait a couple of weeks to see that one. But that's a little bit more animated stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah so cool. This was so good. I decided like to go, you know, and listen to some of the back catalog that I had not. Do you remember where Hooray, it's a death trap <laughs> for the title? It almost yeah. sounds Monty Python. Yeah, it, it actually it came to me during a shower. We had a <laughs> we, uh, we had a really big problem. We, we had recorded the album and we had the artwork and everything, but we had no title at all. And the record company were at, were at us, and you have to decide uh, for a record title now. And it, we had no idea. It was totally, we were totally blocked. And I just went to, I took a shower, and I don't know where it came from. I think, if I remember it correctly, I was listening to a Grand Funk album, and they have a song called Hooray. And I don't know where the death trip came from. It's sort of a reference to life, I guess. Uh, sort of hooray it's a death trip we're all gonna die at the end <laughs> and That's i remember really when, when we sent it to the record label and they don't we don't get it and I, but that's the title we're sticking to it now you got your title and I, we don't get it at all That's and I, great. it was the same with the cover for that album as well they like 
we don't get it. And that's probably one of those when I said I said earlier that we made decisions that maybe were a little bit weird. And nowadays, <laughs> when you look back at it, I don't know. But I, it made sense at the time, I guess. <laughs> it's a good record. It's it good is. Record. It is really yeah. good. Yeah. So was the creative process on the uh, Wheel of Illusion the same or different from recording Earthrise? I was basically the same. I mean, we've recorded in the same studio now and with the same guy as well. Uh, we, it's the third album we've done with him. So it, this one was basically more or less the same. Uh, we sort of have a, a good way of working with him and a good way of communicating. And, and he knows us and we know him and, and we know the studio as well. And so we can work really quickly. And as I said, I, I mentioned earlier, we wrote it a little bit different this time but it was basically we, we have a good setting now that we're really pleased with we were discussing a little bit before the recording if we should go away and find a, a different studio and sort of try to focus and, and take a couple of weeks and, and just go someplace else but because this studio um, we've been using now is located uh, where i live so you sort of work and you go home and you sleep in your own bed and it's it could be a good thing but it could also be a bad thing because then you it's really nice to go into the studio and just focus on recording for a couple of weeks and not having to worry about sort of family life or work life or whatever but uh, it's so easy to to work here and and get stuff done quickly so and it's cheaper as well at the end of the day so yeah no i we, love we the arrangements you, you, yeah. you can tell that you could tell that you guys it's a very mature sounding mix and the drums are very crisp and it, it doesn't sound overcrowded with too many guitar tracks, like a lot of uh, albums I hear now, especially metal albums. So yeah. I, I like the space in the mix. It reminds me of like kind of the seventies, you know, type of vibe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably one of the things that sort of people forget. If you listen to all these older bands, like put on a Led Zeppelin album, there's a lot of, lot of lights and shades uh, and they don't overcrowd it. And if you listen to Black Sabbath, they, they're doing a lot of stuff in in minor keys. You, you always have minor keys, but they also have major keys in the stuff. And they have a lot of space and, uh, and sort of acoustic parts as well. And you have to have a little bit of everything. If you just sort of down, down tune everything and play heavy, it becomes boring. You have to have uh, sort of lighter moments as well, because that, turns the heavier stuff even heavier heavier if right. it makes sense but they weren't packing in 19 tracks of guitar you know what i mean it no, just, no, no. It, just it really <laughs> sounds so much better when you don't overcrowd that that you know and the yeah, tracks it, are really varied in sound yeah, they are. yeah yeah after we watched your video and then i got the bug to go watch some old sabbath so i watched yeah. i found an old war pigs he's not singing the lyrics right and i thought no, you, no. you know I forgot about that. Ozzy doesn't yeah. sing the lyrics right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but it, that's cool. It's a way ke to keep things fresh, and that's that's the same when we play live as well. We try to sort of extend parts and, and makes sort of keep it fresh for each other as well. And and the last couple of tours we had done, we also changed set lists from from night to night, uh, sort of just to keep keep uh, all of us on our toes because we done a couple of tours where we played we did a long tour with monster magnet we played the same set list for every night every night for for like 60 days in a row and you could play it in your sleep and it was really tight and focused but it was sort of boring in a way uh, gotcha. so so we said for this last couple of tours we we changed songs each and every night and one we could start with one song one night and next night it's at the end of the set and it's really interesting to see how how um, sort of where you put it in the set the song can turn out really different uh, energy energy wise and everything yeah just kind of a kind of a trivia type question you you were in firebird with uh, bill steer yeah what was that like i remember when when firebird came out i thought Bill Steer from Carcass has a stone rock band. What yeah. was what was that like? I mean, what was he like? You know, uh, he's he's a great guy. We we we're still in contact with. I tried to see him whenever I'm in London. He uh, this this past November he was actually in Mexico. But whenever I'm in London, I try to see him. And and if he's in, if he's in Sweden as well, uh, we try to see each other. But he he's a 
he's sort of the most humble guy you could ever meet. And that's sort of interesting because he he's sort of like this guy who, who sort of invented both grindcore and all, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. But he's sort of most the most uh, down to earth guy you could ever meet. And I, I got to know him through Mike Amot. I played with Mike from Arch Enemy and Spiritual Vegas, and he, he they were friends, obviously from Caucus. So I think it was Mike who mentioned me and Joel, our drummer, because Bill had to, he, he was missing a drummer and a bass player. So we did a, we did one album with him and, and played a couple of shows as well. And then, unfortunately, Quill took a lot of time and I was playing in Spiritual Vegas um, at that time as well. So yeah. there's only 24 hours a day that yeah. you can work with. <laughs> and he was really anxious to go out and tour, and we we had tours planned, so it it didn't work out. But we're still friends. It's a it's a really cool album. It was really fun to record with him. Everything was live. We recorded wow. everything live in the studio in the same room, all the old, all three of us. So uh, yeah, a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. All right, should we do our game? Sure. All right, so we do a game on our show. Yeah. Uh, this is called Five Random Questions with Stace. That's me. Um, so I have a hundred questions in front of me. I want you to pick five numbers and they will correspond to the five questions we will ask you. Okay. So we'll start with, uh, I, I think I'll start with my daughter's birthday. <laughs> Number six. <laughs> okay. All right, go ahead. Pick four more numbers and then we'll start. Uh, six and 14. And uh, we can take 19. 28 and 73 because I was born in 1973 for no <laughs> other reason. <laughs> All right. Uh, number six, what would we find on top of your refrigerator? Uh, dust. <laughs> <laughs> I think that could be true for almost everyone. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Every now and then I get up on the ladder to clean the microwave and I look over and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, the thing you do like once a year. You yeah. like <laughs> over the refrigerator and the cupboard. there are the there's the bags I was trying to find. There yeah, they are. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, number fourteen. What is your favorite comfort food? Uh, peanuts. I'm really? a sucker for peanuts. Yeah. So much. I am actually. I went to the doctor, and he said you had to lay off peanuts because your blood pressure is quite high. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's funny. It's too much salt, I guess. <laughs> the uh, yeah, uh, growing up, uh, Americans, we love our peanut butter, like peanut butter yeah. sandwiches. Was like you know. And I've often said that people from other countries must think that's weird because peanut yeah. butter's weird, you know. So yeah, I love peanut all forms of <laughs> peanut. I I love it. That's cool. <laughs> I actually that's cool, got man. my daughter. She went to the store, to the supermarket to buy some stuff, and she's like, "Can I buy anything? Yeah, buy a bag of peanuts. I'm out of peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm doing after this. Peanuts. <laughs> Do you like them dry roasted? Because it's weird in the south here. Like yeah. if you go down to the deep south, they're all boiled, and I was like wild because yeah. we don't do that here no nah, I, I like all kinds of dry roasted salted we have like ch chili nuts do you have that in america as well sort of yeah. uh, so sort of coated with uh, sort of chili that's yeah, really yeah. good as well. yeah i love it yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I never tried the boiled peanuts though no. um 19 what would you do if you were invisible for a day who if i were invisible for a day i don't know Sneak up on people <laughs> and sort of scare them. <laughs> Just being a ghost, sort of taking sort of uh, paper from people's offices and stuff and just seeing how they react. <laughs> <laughs> like pranks uh, on I haven't thought of that one. Well, it was a great question. I think I would or just sort of enjoying the sort of moment of being left alone. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm pretty sure we got one of them around here because I'm always going, where is my coffee? <laughs> yeah. always, like, how did I lose a whole cup of coffee? Yeah. Yeah. I lose my caps all the time. I have them everywhere. And I'm like asking, have I this, uh, anyone seen my trucker cap? And then like, not again. How <laughs> difficult is it to put it somewhere where you sort of know where you have it? <laughs> Horrible. We're always losing our glasses too. Yeah. yeah. We, Mark always says they're they're somewhere laughing at us. They're all together. Yeah. yeah, here we are. Yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Yeah. 
So the same thing with guitar picks as well. They always disappear as well. Yeah. All, yeah. all, all gathering somewhere. <laughs> yeah, all together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number 28. Are you good at cooking or baking? And what would your specialty be? Cooking. I, I really enjoy cooking, actually. Uh, and I cook quite a lot. Uh, and I always enjoy that. It's sort of it sort of connects to to being a creative person i guess yes. just playing music and everything and sort of trying I, I don't like sort of cooking to recipes i try to find my own way of doing stuff and and i really enjoy that it's sort of really a good way to sort of wind down from a day of work or whatever um, and trying different stuff i really enjoy cooking and my children always say oh this is one of your those dish, dishes that you serve once and you can never do it again because you never you never know how you did it <laughs> so, so there's I, been a lot of that during their whole sort of upbringing a lot of one-time dishes that they have enjoyed okay. and I, I can't cook him again because i don't know what i did <laughs> do the kids like your cooking they like it yeah yeah they oh, do cool. uh That's i only cool. have one my oldest one has left she's at university now so so she's 22 years old but i have a she's not a kid anymore she's 18 she would kill me if i called her a kid she's 18 so <laughs> well, i understand yeah 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 we get that quite often i'll make something from mark he's like what is it i'm like i don't know yeah, yeah. yeah. she's a, she's a great cook she like she likes to take a recipe and then kind of change yeah. it just slightly yeah yeah, so yeah slightly different. something different instead of sort different. of minced meat you use chicken or whatever try to right. find different stuff uh, I, I yeah as, as i said it's sort of a i think it's the same creative vein i guess from us uh, with music definitely mm -hmm. all right so we're up to 73 what is something that normal people do that is actually pretty weird normal people do this actually pretty weird <laughs> there's a lot of stuff here in sweden that people do that is weird <laughs> uh, that was a tricky one normal people do that it's weird picking their nose no that's human <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that one what have a previous guests answered I'm kind of curious <laughs> um, you know just silly stuff like yeah. um, you know I like I, when I get done my shower, I love to walk around with a towel on my head for a while. Yeah. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> yeah, I always think it's it's interesting when you go into a restaurant and there's people that are all sitting at the table and they're all on their phones. No one's talking. Yeah, all just, that's that, weird. That's, I think. that's yeah. definitely the one weird thing that sort of we're not socialized. We're sitting here supposed supposed to socialize and we're all staring at our phones and phones. <laughs> uh, yeah and I, I that is something that is really weird I I, I, you, I I just recently changed work but previously I, I worked as a teacher and a, and a, a principal as well uh, and seeing a lot of people sort of when they pick up their, their ki uh, kids from school uh, instead of enjoying the moment with their kids sort of after days hard days of work they're on their phones sort of on Instagram and Facebook instead of taking time with your with your with your child and sort of listening to what have how have your day been and what have you learned in school today that's a weird thing and I think that's uh, we're starting to see that as well the children had uh, I was sort of reflecting to that as well sort of really want to have the attention from the from their parents in a way that they really don't get a lot of them which it makes me sad. That's true. Have you, you were principal. What was some of the uh, strangest um, situations where children were sent to you, sent to the principal's oh. office? Uh, not really. I, I was principal for s sort of the youngest children from, from six oh, okay. to 12. So nothing really, nothing really. And we don't really work that way in Sweden. Sort of going to the principal's office is not a sort of a punishment. It's sort ah. of much more uh sort of a i don't know how you should put it i mean we're sort of working trying to if if it's if a children react to something or or is angry there's usually a reason for it and then it's our sort of our uh, job to find out what is it uh, and usually it's stuff it could be stuff from home something yeah. happened parents are getting a divorce or whatever or they just have a hard time in school so it's sort of 
almost like being a detective and trying to find out and find what what is it why is this kid behaving this way uh, so it was an interesting job but it was a tough job as a tough job as well seeing a lot of kids having a hard time it's very evolved compared to our country <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was sent to the principal a couple times for the dumbest reason correcting yeah. my english teacher's grammar Okay. <laughs> After I did it like the third time she sent me. Yeah. And I just, you know, I was like, you know, I don't know. I always had trouble with English teachers because I was always very good at it. And they just, yeah. I don't know. I, I was, sent I was to being it. a yeah. smart I ass was, all the time. Yeah. yeah. I was sent to the principal's office when I went to school for setting fire to my chemistry book. <laughs> I, I think that was, that was fair. <laughs> I just yeah, things have, was things like, have gotten better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I always sort of because I I went to the same school there where I, where as as I was working as a principal and I always sort of related to that. Or I remember when I went here as a kid and had to talk to the principal because I had set fire to my chemistry book. And now now I'm the principal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And t talking about books, when when we were in college, we had to buy our own books, and the books were so expensive. It would be like you didn't want the book anyway, but some accounting no. book would be like one hundred and fifty dollars, and it was just yeah. like. And then when you go to sell it back, that you'd only get thirty dollars. It was terrible. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or even worse, they'd say, "Oh, that's an old edition now," and yeah. you just had to take it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, exactly. You can use that one. That's an old edition. Yeah. No beer you money. Same yeah. use university here in uh, in Sweden. You have to buy all your books, but uh, like preschool or or high school and everything is free for everyone. So. Yeah. I always That's like funny. the teacher. You had to buy the book that they wrote. I'm like, I yeah, that, that was never yeah, good because yeah. you knew they were going to make you learn all of the book because they wrote. Yeah, it. yeah. they they put oh. their heart and soul into that book, <laughs> and and now you have to suffer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This turned into an interesting conversation. <laughs> we're like talking school books now. We're supposed to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Your yeah. your uh, hard rock yeah. album, but yeah, it, it turned into something different. <laughs> yeah. yeah, back to you guys. So you mentioned yeah. uh, your thirty year celebration coming up. How did that come together, and what are you including in that? Yeah, do you know, like as far as set list. Yeah, we when we had that show in last May, we did that uh, mm -hmm. anniversary show. So we got uh, all the members, all the previous members, actually agreed to come. And we had a couple of other guests as well. People that played on the albums. Uh, uh, so we did a, a show in our hometown uh, here in a small small village actually called Monstros. Uh, so we got everyone involved and played songs from all the albums. I think we played two, two or three from each album and had all the members play on the songs they pl played on the album. So it was a really cool experience. It was really cool to... Sort of see a couple of the, of the guys who, who have been in the band years ago. Uh, they they had an, a, a bass player who didn't play on any albums, but I, I uh, he he played for a couple of years on a, on a couple of demos before the first album, and he hadn't played bass in thirty years. But he came to the show and and he had to borrow a bass for me because he didn't have any have have, have anyone. <laughs> himself but it was good seeing everyone and just having a good time and we had a, a big party af afterwards and just uh, being able to be friends and sort of celebrate uh, celebrate together was really cool because I don't think all bands you know, are able to do that it's usually a, a couple of people don't get along or whatever so they can't yeah. do it but everyone agreed and everyone sort of yeah of course I'm coming that sounds uh, fabulous so that, that was really a That's fun great. night that's great. Do you have yes. um, one favorite bass that you usually use take for shows or do you only have one? Yeah, I have one. I have an old Fender Precision bass I had for 25 years. That's my go-to bass for most shows and, and recording as well. And then I have tons of stuff actually sitting around a lot of it. I think I have <laughs> 11 or 12 basses here. Uh, yeah. There's a saying in that you you can always have one more bass. <laughs> <laughs> We went to a show the other day. It was a death metal band, and the yeah. bass player had this old '70s Firebird bass. It just didn't match the music. I was expecting to hear Cactus or something, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have a uh, I have a Thunderbird here as well, and I have a Rickenbacker. And I think I have three or four different Fenders, and I think I have a I have a, a 
eight string bass as well and I love just buying stuff and and always sort of for different songs on different albums. Uh, this one with on the last track on the album, Wild Mustang. There's a little bit of fretless bass at the end as well, uh, which I try to stick it, stick in every once in a while. I think I've used it once before, uh, so I think it's kind of interesting to get a sort of a different vibe, I guess. Yeah. But the yeah, Fender, the old, yeah, the old Fender Precision seventy eight. That that is the one I'm sort of. If the house were on fire, that would be the one I would bring. It's been around the world so many times, and it's sort of my go to base. So when so when you go on tour, do you do you take like um, do you take the the more expensive base with you, like the collector with you, or do you have like a one that's more practical? I I I just I can't imagine a Rickenbacker going in. Uh, the airport packing that and, and actually taking care of it and and if what if they lose it you know that sort of thing yeah, yeah it's a hard time I, I actually we went to the netherlands we did a flying show a couple of years ago and they lost the fender base my my go-to base yeah. <laughs> we got wow. there uh, to amsterdam and it's supposed to the festival people came and picked us up and my base was missing <laughs> and i was <laughs> And we came to the festival and no bass, and so we had to borrow some locals, some stuff from from some uh, from a local band there, and yeah. did the show. And when we got back to the hotel late at night, there was a knock on the door, and and the bass was there. But I was really nervous for Ooh, for a while. Yeah. It's not it's it's not that it's super expensive, but it's such a part of me, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and you heard like horror stories and. Uh, there's a couple uh, the the Rick and Becker, as you said that I I don't usually if we're doing fly out shows I don't take that one uh, it's been a lot of problems here for the last couple of years in in Europe with with the air uh, stuff getting lost on at airports so yeah and I try to sort of always when we, we we're doing shows sort of I never leave stuff behind I always take it to with me to the hotel room because it's so easy for stuff to disappear oh yeah yeah my dad had this bright idea one time when they went my mom and dad went on a cruise he put all their shoes in one suitcase and i yeah. think somebody thought it was valuable and somebody stole all their shoes they had yeah. no shoes i was like oh my god walking around barefoot <laughs> i think it was an interview i read and again some of this you have to take with a grain of salt but i think it was paul from the sex pistols he said that it, he lived behind Hammersmith Odeon and they didn't lock it. And so he would yeah. steal instruments. They would set up. He, all his instruments were stolen at one point in his life from Hammersmith yeah, Odeon. Yeah. <laughs> Probably true. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Because we're talking yeah. mid 70s here. Yeah. 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 So outside Sweden, um, where do you think your biggest fan base is? Uh, we played a lot in in uh, Netherlands and, and Germany. Our record label is German. We have, we had a, a German record label for over twenty years now. Uh, so I think Central Europe, uh, France. We're doing shows in France and Belgium and Netherlands in May. Um, Germany. We played quite a lot in Italy as well. So sort of main main Europe, Central mm -hmm. Europe, uh, and also Sweden as well. Would you consider coming back to the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. We actually had an offer. We had an offer this for for doing some. Uh, I think it was a festival in Las Vegas, but it came. It was a little bit of a short notice, so hopefully we will be able to do it next year. It's okay. a little bit more difficult nowadays, and you have to sort everything out with with um, uh, yeah, airplane tickets and uh, have to have all the right paperwork and stuff. So it's it's difficult. We got it sort of, a, can you come in like three weeks and it's impossible to organize oh, yeah. things. Well, visas and all. Yeah, getting yeah. visas yeah. is so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's 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 expensive as well. So if you're going, you, you can't really go for just one show. You have to put a, get together a string of dates yeah. to sort of uh, make ends meet. But definitely, we we would love to come back. So it's something we always try to. And it just had to be the right time and and the right situation, I guess. Oh, well, we'd love to have you over. Yes, we would. Yes, yeah. we have any any vote at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations on this album. It is fantastic. Yes, we really love it. Thanks yeah. a lot. This is the Snaggletooth Rock and Roll Podcast. <laughs>